Yes, we do have an eat and ask after the service today. There's um, pork loin, brisket, chicken, sausage, hot dogs, uh, potatoes, rice, beans and corn, cream corn, apple crisp and peach cobbler. No, whatever y'all brought, whatever y'all brought as well. So it should be a good time. Um, and my wife is back there furiously trying to thaw it all and get it nice and hot for when we go back there. Um, if you read your email, uh, you know that I'm starting a new book today. We're starting Romans today. I don't usually check my email, but I um, found out I was doing Romans the day I read about it in the newspaper. I was <laughs> shocked. No. Um, I'm looking forward to doing Romans. I'm looking at about, oh, let's say 24 verses per chapter. Two verses per message would be 12, would be one chapter uh, for 12 messages. I give 12 messages in a year. So it'd be one message per year. So we're looking about 16 years. <laughs> I'm either going to be dead or I retire after this. This is my swan song. This is it. <laughs> this is the last thing. Uh, I've done all the uh, letters that Paul's written except for Romans, 1st and 2nd Corinthians. And I didn't want to do 1st and 2nd Corinthians. So um, I'm looking forward to it. Should be fun. Um, allow me to go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we thank you for your word, for your truth, for the salvation that we have in your son, for the revelation that we have of him in your word. We pray that we grow in grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior as we study through this book. We pray that you would um, guide us into all the truth by your spirit. We thank you for the salvation we have in Christ. We thank you for the resurrection from the dead. We pray that hearts be ready to receive this truth, that your name would be honored and glorified. Help us to understand it and to live it, that your name would be exalted in all the earth through your people. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Paul. What comes to mind when you think of Paul? Maybe one of the brilliant scholars of his day. Maybe a, a Pharisee of Pharisees before he became a Christian. Maybe his amazing conversion on the road to Damascus. What did Paul say about himself? It says in Romans chapter 1, Paul, a bondservant of Christ Jesus. Paul saw himself first and foremost as a bondservant, a slave, if you will, of Christ Jesus. And yet he, he enjoyed it. He loved it. Rome, the people he writes to, the Romans, would have understood this because there were millions upon millions of slaves at that time that were considered nothing more than a piece of property. Paul didn't consider himself a piece of property that belonged to the Lord Christ. He, he saw himself something different. In fact, if we look in Exodus chapter 21, 1 through 6, we'll see what Paul really thought of himself as a bondservant. Now, if, if you're aware of what's in Exodus chapter 20, that's where the Ten Commandments are. Exodus 21 is where the Eleventh Commandment is. And so forth and so on until we get all 635 of them. So here's the Eleventh Commandment. Exodus 21, verse 1. Now these are the ordinances which you were to set before them. If you buy a Hebrew slave, he shall serve for six years, but on the seventh he shall go out as a free man without payment. 
So you could get a slave because he owed you money, and he would work it off. But after seven years, you're supposed to let him go free. Verse 3 says, if he comes alone, he shall go out alone. If he is the husband of a wife, then his wife shall go out with him. If his master gives him a wife, and she bears him sons or daughters, the wife and her children shall belong to her master. He shall go out alone. Sounds kind of weird, doesn't it? But if the slave plainly says, I love my master, my wife, and my children, I will not go out as a free man. Then his master shall bring him to God, and he shall bring him to the door of the doorpost. And his master shall pierce his ear with an awl, and he shall serve him permanently. How many of y'all would like to be a slave to somebody? How many of y'all would like to be a slave permanently to somebody that you could never get out of? All your hands should be raised, right? Because I hope you'd want to be a slave of Christ. What, what greater master could you ever have? Galatians 1, chapter 10 says the following. Paul is is defending his gospel and he says things like if any man is preaching to you a gospel contrary to what I preached to you let him be accursed anathema damned to hell for am I now seeking the favor of men or of God well you don't say things like that if you're seeking the favor of men or am I striving to please men? If I were still trying to please men, I would not be a bondservant slave of Christ. Paul had no desire to please men. Now, he did before he became a Christian. He wanted to please men in every way because he thought that's how he earned his righteousness before God is by pleasing men. Now pleasing man has no business, no, no effect in Paul's life. He has no use for pleasing man at all. He wants to please Christ. That brings us to Matthew chapter 6, verse 24, where we remember Jesus said that a man cannot serve two masters. Matthew 6, 24 said, no one, no one, not you, not me, not anyone, no one can serve two masters. For either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God in wealth. You cannot. No one can serve two masters. No one can serve God and the things of this world. No one can serve God and men. You need to make a choice. You need to make a decision. Are you going to serve Christ and him alone? Or are you going to serve the things of this world? Paul thought it was his highest honor and he wanted people to know first and foremost, he was a bondservant of Christ Jesus. And not only does he say he's a bondservant of Christ Jesus, but he also says he's called as an apostle, or he is a called apostle. Now, what does this word mean? The word apostle, which we almost transliterate, comes from apa and stello. 
Apa means from, stolo means send. It means to send forth someone with power and authority of the one who sent him. Again, the Romans would understand this with their kings and emperors sending out their emissaries and their ambassadors who would be apostles of the emperor, apostles of the king. They were sent out with authority by that king or by that emperor to um, do what the king said. I heard someone once give a message that went something like this. King was very upset with his subjects and what they were doing. And he sent an ambassador to go tell these people, hey look, you guys need to straighten up and fly right, or we're going to bring in the big guns. So straighten up, do what is right, or suffer the consequences. The ambassador takes off, and he's thinking, wow, that's a real rough message from the king. I don't think I want to tell these people this. They may stone me to death or something like that. So he begins to think, I know what I'll do. I'll change it just a little bit. By the time he gets there, he has his message. And he goes before these people that the king is furious with and says, I just want to let you know that the king loves you and has a wonderful plan for your life. It wasn't what the king said to do, was it? The king sent forth his ambassador to let the people know that there were consequences for their sin. The ambassador changed the message. It wasn't the message the king sent. When did Paul or Saul become an apostle? Let's look in Acts chapter 9, verses 1 through 16. This is the most amazing event in all of history, considering what's going on. Now Saul, who is our Apostle Paul, still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest and asked for letters from him to the synagogues at Damascus, so that if he found any belonging to the way, that is, any who were Christians, both men and women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. Now, why was he bringing them bound to Jerusalem? He might want to imprison them, but I think he wanted to put them to death. Saul was breathing threats and murder against the disciples. He went to the high priest and got letters of commendation, recommendation to bring anyone who was a Christian in any synagogue in Damascus back to Jerusalem. Now, as, as he was traveling, it happened that as he was approaching Damascus, and suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him, and he fell to the ground and heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Saul thought he was persecuting the church. Saul thought he was persecuting Christians. But he was actually persecuting Christ. And he said, who are you, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. But get up and enter the city, and it will be told to you what you must do. The men who traveled with him stood speechless, hearing the voice, but seeing no one. Now, what they heard was not the voice that Paul heard. This word hearing means hearing without understanding. They did not understand what was being said. They, un they understood something was being communicated, but they did not hear it clearly. 
Saul got up from the ground, and though his eyes were open, he could see nothing. And leading him by the hand, they brought him into Damascus. He was there three days without sight, and neither ate nor drank. Now, there was a disciple at Damascus named Ananias. The Lord said to him in a vision, Ananias, and he said, Here, my Lord. And the Lord said to him, Get up and go to the street called Straight, and inquire at the house of Judas for a man from Tarsus named Saul, for he is praying. And he has seen in a vision a man named Ananias, that's going to be you, come in and lay hands on him so that he might regain his sight. But Ananias answered, Lord, I have heard from many about this man, how much harm he did to your saints at Jerusalem. And now he's come to Damascus, he's going to take all the people here. And here he has authority from the chief priest to bind all those who call on your name. Why would I give him his sight? But the Lord said to him, Go, for he is a chosen instrument of mine to bear my name before the Gentiles and kings and the sons of Israel. For I will show him how much he will suffer. He must suffer for my name's sake. So Ananias departed and entered the house, and after laying his hands on him, said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus, who appeared to you on the road by which you were coming, has sent me so that he may regain, so that you may regain your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. And immediately there fell from his eyes something like scales, and he regained his sight, and he got up and was baptized. And he took food and was strengthened. I don't know if y'all see what's going on here, but this is, this is more than miraculous. One, Jesus stops a man who's persecuting him, i.e. his church, and asks him why he's doing so. Never gets a straight answer, but he converts Paul then and there. Paul becomes a changed man. How much of a changed man? Think about it. He was a Pharisee of Pharisees. He was a Jewish Jew. He was everything Jewish a man could want to be. Now he is the apostle to the Gentiles. The apostle to the Gentiles. The Gentiles are dogs, right? Yeah, they're dogs. You know who's a bigger dog than any of the Gentiles? Saul, Paul, and he knew it. He knew he was a, a bad news guy. He knew he had tasted of the grace of God, and that God had changed him mightily. In 1 Corinthians chapter 1, in verse 1, we read the following. Paul, called as an apostle by the will of God, and Sosthenes, our brother. We can read the same thing in 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 1. Paul, an apostle by the will of God, and Timothy, our brother. What does Paul add in those two introductions? He is an apostle... By the will of God. Paul did not take this to himself. Paul would never have taken this to himself. Saul wanted anything but to be an apostle of Jesus Christ for any purpose. He was set on bringing people bound to Jerusalem where they would suffer death. He was an apostle by the will of God. Then in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 1 and 2, we read the following. He 
says, am I not free? Am I not an apostle? Yes, Paul was free. Paul was free in Christ. Paul was an apostle. Have I not seen Jesus our Lord? Yes, he had. What's Paul getting at here? He is an apostle of Jesus Christ to the Gentiles. He has seen the resurrected Lord Jesus, which makes him qualified to be an apostle. It said something similar in chapter 15, verse 8. It says in verse 3, For I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for, this, for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that he was buried and that he was raised on the third day according to the Scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas and then to the twelve, and he appeared to more than 500 brethren at one time, most of whom remain until now, but some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, then he appeared to the apostles, and last of all, as to one untimely born, he appeared to me also. Paul never really got over the fact that Jesus saved him. It always struck him. It always amazed him. He always wanted to break out in praise whenever he thought that Jesus would save a sinner like him. But Jesus showed himself to Paul. And Paul was an apostle. Not only was he a bondservant and an apostle, but it says he was set apart for the gospel of God. Now consider Paul's separation to be a Pharisee. This word that means set apart means Pharisee. <laughs> so Paul was set apart not to be a Pharisee, but he was set apart for the gospel. Consider Paul's separation to be a Pharisee. If you remember that parable that Jesus gave about the tax collector and the Pharisee who went down to the temple to pray. And the Pharisee prayed to himself because God wasn't listening. Prayed to himself, God, I'm glad I'm not like this guy over here, this tax collector. I tithe of everything I get. I do this uh, and he tied down to the littlest amount. Just seems like it's such a worthless life, in my opinion, to sit there and try to keep all 613 commandments. If you break one, it's all over. How could you do that? How could you subject yourself? But this Pharisee loved it. And Paul loved it. Paul would tithe. If he was given a penny, he would give a tenth of a penny. That's how he, serious he was at keeping God's law. But this word set apart is a perfect passive participle now. What does that mean? Perfect means it is completed action. It is over. Also means that the results, the conclusions, the effects of it are permanent. They cannot be taken away. Jesus used the perfect tense when he died on the cross when he said to telestai. Telao means to come to the goal, to reach the finish line. What did Jesus say? It has been finished. It is finished with the result that it always will be finished. It never won't be finished. It is finished. It is over with. There's nothing that needs to be added to it. That was the idea of the perfect tense. This is the perfect tense too. Paul has been set apart for the gospel of God. He cannot be not set apart. He will be set apart forever for the gospel's sake. That's what God did to him. It's a passive participle, which means that Paul didn't set himself apart. 
He was set apart by God for the gospel's sake. Let's take a look at Galatians 1.15. In Galatians 1.15 we read, But when God, who had set me apart since when? Since when Jesus chose the twelve and uh, one was going to fall away and God needed to fill a slot or something like that. No, 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 no. Maybe it's after Saul was breathing threats to the uh, saints in Damascus and God needed to get him straightened out so he straightened Paul no 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 but when God who had set me apart even from my mother's womb and called me through his grace was pleased to reveal his son in me that I might preach him among the Gentiles I did not immediately consult with flesh and blood nor did I go up to Jerusalem to those who were apostles before me but I went away to Arabia return once more to Damascus. When was Paul set apart for the gospel's sake? From his mother's womb. You know what that means? If this individual was set apart to be an apostle to the Gentiles from his mother's womb, but he was allowed to grow up to be a Pharisee, he was allowed to grow up and be the one who had all the coats when they stoned Stephen. He breathed out murderous threats against the disciples in Jerusalem. He breathed out murderous threats against the disciples in Damascus. God allowed all of that to happen in Paul's life, even though he had been set apart from his mother's womb to be an apostle to the Gentiles. What about this gospel of God? If we look at Galatians chapter 1, verses 1 through 9, we read, Paul, an apostle, not sent from men nor through the agency of men, but through Jesus Christ and God the Father who raised him from the dead, and all the brethren who are with me to the churches of Galatia. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, who gave himself for our sins. They might rescue us out of this present evil age, according to the will of our God and Father, to whom be the glory forevermore. Amen. I am amazed that you are so quickly deserting him who called you by the grace of Christ for a different gospel, which is really not another, only there are some who are disturbing you and want to distort the gospel of Christ. How were they wanting to distort the gospel of Christ? They wanted to add works. They wanted to add human effort they wanted to add something you could do along with the grace of God but something you could do that God would be pleased with but even if we or an angel from heaven should preach to you a gospel contrary to what we have preached to you let him be accursed even if I preach something different let me be accursed if an angel preaches something different to you, let him be accursed. Salvation is by grace and by grace alone, period. As we have said before, so I say again now, if any man is preaching to you a gospel contrary to what you have received, he is to be accursed. So what are we going to learn in Romans? We're going to learn of a gospel that is the gospel of God. The good news that God has sent forth. Not the good news that man has sent forth. Good news of man is that he has survived the hurricane, right? Good news of man is that he's raised $29 million for people who have suffered in Houston. I'm thankful that they've raised $29 million for those who've suffered in Houston. But all those are works of men we're going to learn of the work of God the salvation of God the gospel of God for which Paul was set apart for which Paul was called as an apostle for which 
Paul was a bondservant of Jesus Christ. And yeah, he says in verse 2, which he promised beforehand in his prophet, through his prophets in the Holy Scripture. Where can we read of the gospel before the gospel ever comes into being, so to speak? In the Old Testament. Did you know that? Do you know that the gospel is in the Old Testament? Well, it must be because if we turn to Luke chapter 24... And we look at verses 13 through 35, we read the following. And behold, two of them were going that very day to a village named Emmaus, which was about seven miles from Jerusalem. And they were talking with each other about these things which had taken place. While they were talking and discussing, Jesus himself approached and began traveling with them, but their eyes were prevented from recognizing him. And he said to them, What are these words that you are exchanging with one another as you are walking? And they stood still looking sad. And one of them, named Cleopas, answered and said to him, Are you the only one visiting Jerusalem and unaware of the things which have happened here in these days? Are you the only one that doesn't know that there was this guy who said he was the Christ, that he was crucified? Now people are saying he was raised from the dead. Are you the only one who hadn't heard of this? They're asking Jesus this. This is rather comical. And he said to them, what things? They said to him, the things about Jesus the Nazarene, who was a prophet mighty in deed and word and sight of God and all the people, and how the chief priests and the rulers delivered him to the sentence of death and crucified him. But we were hoping that it was he who was going to redeem Israel. Indeed, Besides all this, it is the third day since these things have happened. But also some women among us amazed us. When they were at the tomb early this morning and did not find his body, they came saying that they had also seen a vision of angels who said that he was alive. He is not here. He is risen just as he said he would. Wow. Some of those who were with us went to the tomb and found it exactly as the women had said, but him they did not see. He said to them, O foolish men, slow of heart to believe in all that the prophets have spoken. Was it not necessary for the Christ to suffer these things and then enter into his glory? Then beginning with Moses and with all the prophets, he explained to them the things concerning himself in all the scriptures. Now what were all the scriptures at that time? The Old Testament only. There were no gospels. There were no uh, writings of Paul. Then beginning with Moses and with all the prophets, He explained to them the things concerning himself in the scripture. Jesus said, you search the scriptures because you think in them you have eternal life. You think that there are enough commandments in the scripture that if you keep them all, you can have eternal life. But it is these that speak of me. The scriptures speak of Christ. If we don't see Christ in the scripture, we have missed the point of the scriptures entirely. So what conclusion can we come to? Paul's consideration of himself in 1 Corinthians 15, 9. I find this to be somewhat humorous. He writes, For I am the least of the apostles, and not fit to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church of God. 
but by the grace of God, I am what I am. And his grace toward me did not prove vain, but I labored even more than all of them. Yet not I, but the grace of God was with me. So Paul says, I worked more than all of them put together, but it wasn't me, it was the grace of God. Paul wants to make sure that you understand it's the grace of God that enables anybody to do anything at all. By the grace of God, I am what I am. I'm an apostle to the Gentiles. And his grace toward me did not prove vain, but I labored, I worked, even more than all of them, all of the other apostles. Yet not I, but the grace of God was with me. Whether then it was I or they, so we preach and so you believed. Doesn't matter who it was. We all preached the same gospel. We all saw the same results. Then in Ephesians chapter 3. Verse 8. Paul is talking about this mystery that was given to him to relay to other people, which was the salvation of the Gentiles on an equal basis with the salvation of the Jews. It was known in the Old Testament that Gentiles would be brought to Jerusalem by Jews and worshipped together there with them. But it was always the Jews that brought them. Now Paul is preaching a gospel that Gentiles are saved by grace through faith alone, and no Jew is necessary. It says to me, the very least of all the saints. You know, if you look at all the saints, Paul was very, la- and you line them up in order of <coughs> prestige or, you know, God got a good one with this guy. You line them all up, Paul's at the end. Paul is at the end. God didn't get much with Paul. The very least of all the saints. This grace was given to preach to the Gentiles the unfathomable riches of Christ. I get to tell Gentiles about unfathomable riches that are found in Christ. I'm having the time of my life, so to speak. I may be the least of all the saints. I may be the worst saint there ever was because I persecuted the church. But God's grace to me was effective. He gave me the willingness and the power to preach the gospel to Gentiles. Then in 1 Timothy, chapter 1, verse 15 it says, It is a trustworthy statement deserving full acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, among whom I am foremost of all. Paul now no longer puts himself at the end of the saints. He now puts himself at the head of the sinners. That's, that's what he thought of himself. And why? He says, well, in Ephesians 3, 8, it was because he persecuted the church. He said, yet for this reason, I found mercy, so that in me as the foremost... Jesus Christ might be dem- might demonstrate his perfect patience as an example for those who would believe in him for eternal life. Paul saying God used him as an example. And say if God can save Paul, God can save anyone. That's that's for real. If God can save the persecutor of the church, 
the one who wanted to exterminate the church, the one who held the clothes of the individuals who stoned Stephen, the one who sought letters uh, for people who were worshiping Christ in Damascus to bring them back to Jerusalem to put them to death. If God can save that guy, God can save anyone. Paul was a murderer, you know that? Paul was a murderer. And yet God saved him. So what is it with us? Are we bond servants of Christ? Are we trying to live on the fence, so to speak? One foot in the world, one foot with Christ. Are we bond servants of Christ? Have we, have we sold out for Christ? Are we changing the message? Are we apostles of Jesus Christ? Are we ambassadors of the King and delivering the message that needs to be delivered? And are we a preacher of the gospel? Isaac Watts wrote a hymn called, Am I a Soldier of the Cross? He says, am I a soldier of the cross, a follower of the Lamb? And shall I fear to own his cause or blush to speak his name? Must I be carried to the skies on flowery beds of ease while others fought to win the prize and sailed through bloody seas? Are there no foes for me to face? Must I not stem the flood? Is this vile world a friend to grace to help me on to God? Sure, I must fight if I would reign. Increase my courage, Lord. I'll bear the toil, endure the pain, supported by thy word. Paul suffered greatly. In fact, Ananias had to basically tell Paul how much suffering and persecution God had set apart for Paul to suffer, right? But Paul was willing to suffer whatever costs be a bond servant and an apostle and a preacher of the gospel to the Gentiles. He loved his Lord Jesus that much. May we love him as well. Let me pray. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for your truth. Thank you for the truth that we learn about the apostle Paul. Make us more like Paul, who would be willing to give his life for the sake of the gospel and for the sake of Christ. But even more so, make us like Christ, who was willing to lay down his life for his people. Help us to do those things that are pleasing in your sight, that we might love the Lord our God with all of our mind, soul, strength, and heart. Love our neighbors ourself. And love our brother in Christ as Christ has loved us. In his name we pray. Amen.